So we're going to make a little study of uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 1 and 2, mainly a verse in chapter, chapter 2, but we will look at the, the context. And the reason why we are doing this study is that this is a place in the New Testament which very often have been used as an un anti-apologetic argument saying, okay, there are some people interested in apologetics, in arguing for the faith and trying to be persuasive. But basically, Paul rejected apologetics uh, and advised the Christian communicator to preach Christ and him crucified. So there is a contrast created between apologetics and the communication of the gospel. And of course, then the communication of the gospel about Christ and him crucified needs to have priority. So we should not be too uh, concerned about apologetics. There uh, is a uh, quite well-known commentary from uh, uh, it was written in the late 19th century, but it's been republished many times by uh, Oxford theologian William Ramsey. And he has a, uh, a special interpretation of the events in Acts and how we then, in the light of Acts, should read 1 Corinthians. So when he comments on Paul's activity in Athens, where Paul is clearly very apologetic in his approach. He's arguing with his listeners and um, trying to persuade them. And then Ramsey says this. <clears throat> Paul was, and I quote, disappointed and perhaps disillusioned by his experience in Athens. He felt that he had gone at least as far as was right in the way of presenting his doctrine in a form suited to the current philosophy, and the result had been little more than naught. So Ramsey is here presenting the picture. Paul is working in Athens, trying apologetics, leaving the city, and then on the train between Athens and Corinth, so to speak, he is evaluating. It was not good results in Athens. I need to adjust my strategy. I should not use arguments. Uh, I should not be an apologist. And in light of this reconstruction, Ramsey then reads 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, as an anti-apologetic confession from Paul. So, writing to the church in Corinth, he then reminds them of how it was when he first came to them, and he came to them from Athens. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This interpretation has been quite widespread and used many, many times to try to block out or undermine apologetic efforts. And if the reconstruction is right, of course, I agree, then we should not be too concerned about apologetics. So for me, this is, um, this is an, an important issue and uh, I would like to take it serious, seriously. Uh, I feel called by God to be an apologist. At ALF, apologetics uh, is foundational for quite a lot of the things we are doing. And of course, we do not want to, to work against the, uh, the advice and attitude and, and teaching of, of the Apostle Paul. So uh, I think this is an issue worthy of wrestling with. And I think we should start by, so we know what we are talking about, uh, we should start by reading a part of 1 Corinthians. So if you have a Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we will read from verse 17, and then read, read the whole text until the beginning of chapter 2. 
So 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that one may boast, so, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that you might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. I think on the, on the surface of it, um, Ramsey's theory sounds quite uh, uh, probable. And especially if, um, when we think we are readers after the Enlightenment, when our whole culture have turned against us and say, said, your faith Actually, it does not fit with reason or uh, knowledge. Uh, you can believe it anyway, but it's actually, from an intellectual point of view, it, it is foolishness. And I think that also comes into play here, that it seems quite natural to read the whole passage in this light. Yeah, uh, there are no really good reasons for the Christian faith, but we believe anyway, or we believe for uh, other reasons than intellectual reasons. And even though the first impression can be that maybe Ramsey's interpretation that Paul changed his mind and that this letter is an anti-apologetic uh, letter, I am not at all convinced. And let me explain why. I think Ramsey's uh, interpretation and many Christians' in interpretation of this passage is uh, a faulty one. And first, let us look at the theory that Paul changed his mind, that his speech in Athens was a failure. I don't think that theory holds water at all. I think it's, uh, for sure, the wrong interpretation. For three reasons. First, there is no hint whatsoever from Luke who reports about Paul's ministry, that Acts 17 in Athens, was a failure. On the contrary, Luke gives it premier status as the speech before the Gentiles. If you look at the book uh, uh, Luke has written, you can clearly see that he 
chooses to give us one synagogue sermon, that's Acts 13, which is one full sermon in the synagogue. So we know what and how did Paul preach for a Jewish audience. That's Acts 13, a full sermon. And then he can continue then to say, yes, Paul went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Because we know, okay, we have his sermon. And then he gave us one full sermon before the Gentiles, and that's Acts 17. So we know how Paul presented the gospel uh, to a Gentile audience. And in the text itself, there is no hint of any negative evaluation. Secondly, it was not at all a failure. After one presentation, Paul managed to create curiosity amongst people. So some people said, we want to hear you again on this subject. So they are willing to inquire, to make further inquiry into the gospel. So they start a kind of alpha course in Athens. People want to pursue his message. And then some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. And two of them are named, very influential people, uh, Dionysius, who was a member of the Oropagos, of the, the council, so a very prominent person, and a woman named Damaris, probably also a prominent woman, uh, prominent person because she's named, and a number of others. So, you have at least, you have two named, and then a number of others, so at least five persons became believers after one ser sermon. That's not that bad. <laughs> I think if you are involved in evangelism or in preaching, if we have statistics of five people becoming Christians after every sermon, we would be really thankful. I think some people in their mind have Acts chapter 2 as the reference. Peter spoke at Pentecost and 3,000 came to faith. But that was a totally unique event. There are no other events in, in the book of Acts where 3,000 comes to faith after one sermon. So we cannot have that as the normal um, situation and then ev evaluate Act 17. Oh, only five persons came to faith. That's a failure. It's only the failure if you have put Acts 2 as the norm. But clearly that is not the norm in the book of Acts. And thirdly, Paul did absolutely not change his mind when he left Athens and continued to Corinth. When he came to Corinth, Luke says that Paul went into the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. And people come to faith, there's a split in the synagogue. Uh, sorry, uh, people are coming to faith, there's also a lot of opposition. And Paul's enemies, they can see very clearly what Paul is doing. He is, they are saying, persuading people. So Luke tells that Paul reasoned with people trying to persuade. And he reports that the enemies who were hostile to the Gospels, they acknowledge he's persuading people to become Christians. And if you continue to read in the book of Acts, there is a coherent pattern. Paul was arguing in every place in Acts for the truth of the gospel. Think of Acts 26 when Paul stands before Festus and Festus says, you are out of your mind when Paul mentions the resurrection from the dead. And Paul's answer is, no. My message is true and reasonable. That is his claims before Festus. That is true and reasonable. And then he goes on to argue for the historicity and turns to the king and says, the king knows of this. He can confirm it. So, Paul is not changing his attitude or his strategy or his way of communicating the gospel if you study the book as a whole. 
Okay, let's leave Acts. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. And when we are studying text, we rightly say context is king. In order to understand a text, we need to look at the context of that text. And uh, I recently found out, uh, I think it's a, it's a nice illustration of the uh, importance of context. There was, uh, one or two years ago, a discussion about Vladimir Putin, the Russian president. Because people realized, you know, journalists often sitting in a room like this, and then Putin and, and other high officials or other politicians coming in. So they've been watching Putin many, many times. And they saw there's something wrong with his right arm. Because he's not moving. He, he's walking and that arm has the natural movement. That arm is not moving in a natural way. So there was a discussion. Maybe Putin is sick. And some speculated that Putin has Parkinson. So then the picture was the Russian president is weak, he is sick, he will be crippled. He's a picture of weakness. Uh, <clears throat> uh, here is, uh, and you can find a lot of discussion on the net on this. Vladimir Putin reduced right arm swing. So many people started to notice he's not moving his right arm. You see his right arm is quite close to his body and the other arm is having the natural the natural movement. Okay? So Western journalists, not knowing the true context, interpreted from their context as Putin is sick. Now, since this become a big, big issue, uh, people started to widen the research and found out the Russian context. And that is very different. Now it's... Uh, it's quite clear that Putin is not sick. He's, he's not having Parkinson in, in an early stage. But this is a signal of strength. This is the effect of long KGB training, where you're trained not to move your right arm away from your weapon. And you build that into your own body, whole body language, so you can walk without the natural movement of that arm, but that arm continues. So you're always as close as possible to your weapon. And everyone who sees and knows this background understands, okay, he's a highly trained KGB officer. So that is actually a signal of strength. Interesting. Context makes a difference. You look at the same person, the same way of walking, out from one context, you're thinking of Parkinson and weakness. Out from another context, which is the true context, you're thinking of strength, military training. I think we should be really careful when we read 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 and 2 and not put an, um, a foreign context. We need to find out what was the real context for Paul as a writer when he wrote it, and for the church when they received the letter. So let's see if we can find out that. So let's start with Paul as a writer. Do we know anything about the context when he wrote this letter? And can that inform us? Well, this is one of the good things with 1 Corinthians, that we know quite a lot about the background. We know where Paul was when he was writing it. He was in Ephesus. He says it explicitly within the letter, so it's not a guess. But I will stay on at Ephesus, he says in chapter 16. Okay? So he wrote this when he was in Ephesus. Now, then we can study Acts to see what was Paul's ministry when he was in Ephesus. How did Paul preach the gospel in that city? Well, he stayed in Ephesus for a long time. And we know quite a lot about how Paul preached the gospel. In chapter 19, in the book of Acts, he says, or Luke tells, that Paul was arguing persuasively for the kingdom of God. 
one of the strongest statements about apologetics in the book of Acts. He was arguing persuasively for the kingdom of God. And then there is the split in the synagogue. A lot of people are coming to faith. Others who do not uh, want to believe uh, are opposing Paul. He does not want to fight about this, so he takes his disciples with him. He rents another place, that is the lecture hall of Tyrannos. And then Luke says they had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannos. And there is a lot of debate around Paul. There is, of course, also enemies. Uh, some people are starting to lose their... Um, their business because of, of the success of the gospel. And Luke reports of how the enemies describes Paul's, uh, Paul's uh, mission work. Paul's enemies accused him of having convinced large numbers of people. Okay, what's the point with this? Well, the point is this. It's really hard to imagine Paul being in Ephesus, arguing for the gospel, debating with people in a Turanus lecture hall, having people looking at him and saying, wow, he's convincing large number, and then in his spare time, write the letters to the church in Corinth, saying, you should not do apologetics. I do not do apologetics. It does not fit together. It does not make sense of the context. When he's writing the letter, he is in the midst of a persuasive presentation of the gospel in Ephesus when he writes the letters to Corinth. But then, why on earth is he writing these words then? <laughs> what is the context of the, uh, of the church receiving the letter? Uh, and that would be, be the most crucial thing. What do we know about the city of Corinth? And what can we, are there anything that makes a difference for our understanding of, uh, of the letter? Yeah, interestingly, we know quite a lot. And there are sources from antiquity describing the city, the culture in Corinth. And I think a lot of Christians have heard uh, about uh, all the temple prostitution in Corinth and that the very loose attitude towards sex was something that wo the city was world famous for. And that's true. And you can still uh, visit the uh, uh, Aphrodite temple where all the prostitutes were uh, outside Corinth. Uh, and we know that Paul had to deal with that context in chapter 6 because People had come to faith and joined the church and now believed in Jesus. Some of the men continued to visit the prostitutes. So they just follow the culture of Corinth. Uh, so we are, most, uh, many of us are used to, to uh, we know about that background, which kind of a similar background to parts of, of secular Europe now in terms of the attitude towards sex. But not so many knows about other aspects of the cultural climate of Corinth. But that is also known from sources in antiquity. So here is a, a quote from um, a, uh, a historian, uh, Dio, Chrysostomus Dio, who writes about a visit in Corinth he visited the city uh, during the Isthmian game, uh, the biggest sport games in, in uh, Greek was, of course, the game uh, in Olympus, the, the Olympic game. The second biggest game was the Isthmian game. Every second year they had the Isthmian game in Corinth. And this uh, historian was himself there. And he describes the atmosphere in the city during the Isthmian game. It's, and it's like a circus atmosphere. Here's the quote. That was the time, too, when one could hear crowds of wretched sophists. And I've colored that because we will come back to, uh, 
uh, to who those were. That was the time when one could hear crowds of wretched sophists around Poseidon's temple shouting and re revealing one another and the disciples, as they were called, fighting with one another. Many writers reading aloud their stupid works, many poets reciting their poems while others applaud them, many jugglers showing the tricks, many fortune tellers interpreting fortunes, lawyers innumerable perverting judgment, and peddlers, not a few peddling whatever they happen to have. Okay, so it's a kind of circus atmosphere. Notice what he's saying about those wretched sophists around Poseidon's temple, shouting and arguing with each other. And they have groups of disciples, as they were called, and they were fighting with each other. Now, the sophists were a group of philosophers uh, uh, in, uh, in Greek. They had a long history. But at this time, there were groups of sophists who were using their philosophy in their skill in philosophy in a specific way, which were uh, both appreciated by some, but also highly controversial. They were using rhetoric to manipulate people. And they developed it almost as a sport. Who has the best skill in convincing someone else and convincing an audience? And the more stupid the statement was, the, the more skilled you have to be in order to convince the audience. And they were almost, could be like performing artists. They could come, they could be very well known, come into a city, arrange a meeting, and then ask the public, give me a statement. And then, without preparation, give a speech, arguing for the truth of that statement, statement and doing it so well so all the audience starting to believe in it. That was a way of showing off your rhetorical skill, how gifted you were in using language and manipulating people's feelings and the atmosphere in the room and so on. You know how a good rhetorician can make a really strong impression. And many of them became personalities that were admired because of their talent. And they made a living out of it. So they, they took money uh, for this. <clears throat> Others, then other philosophers, became really critical towards this because this is manipulation. Philosophy is the love of wisdom to really grab the truth, to have tools to see what is true and what is false. The sophists, the wretched sophist, as uh, Dio calls them, they are using the philosophical skills to make money for themselves and manipulate. And they could use it, for example, to manipulate the politicians. So they used their skills to have a politician to be convinced of a certain thing. And the, uh, the king uh, thought, this is the best for me, or this is the best for the, the people. But actually, it was the best for the sophist or for a group he was uh, talking uh, for. So, Philostratus, he says this about the sophistic rhetoric. He called it uh, theatrical shamelessness. They are just playing theater and using it in a morally wrong way. And he describes their flowery, bombastic, their, their speech as flowery, bombastic, full of startling metaphors, too metrical, that has to do with rhythm, too dependent on the tricks of rhetoric, too emotional. With this background, and you start to read 1 Corinthians, suddenly the text is seen very different. different. What Paul is opposing is not reason, it's not arguments, but sophist rhetoric. And notice, I started in chapter 1, verse 17. Notice what, how, what he says there. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence. And the point here is with eloquence, not wisdom in general way, uh, but eloquence. 
he is not one of the sophists visiting the city. And he ends in chapter, or in chapter 2, he says, When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence and human wisdom. I resolved to know nothing but Jesus Christ. So you see, what Paul is saying no to is rhetoric. And uh, further on in the, in the letter, he's really keen on saying, I'm not doing this for money. Uh, I, I'm not using this as a way of my gain. So he's not like the sophists in Athens. Here is uh, Anthony uh, Thistleton, which is a... Um, uh, a very well, known, uh, very well known New Testament scholar. And this is his, um, his big commentary on 1 Corinthians. And he says this. What we now know of the rhetorical background at Corinth releases Paul of any hint of an uncharacteristic or obsessional anti-intellectualism or any lack of imagination or communi communicative flexibility. His settled resolve was that he would not only uh, do only uh, was that he would do only what served the gospel, regardless of people's expectation or seductive shortcuts to success. Most of all, the succession uh, of advertisement. Neither then nor now does the gospel rest on the magnetism of big personalities. So there were people in Corinth expecting people, uh, Paul to proclaim his message like the sophists did. And he had decided, I will not go down that route. Because for, pa for Paul, it's content which is the key thing. The content of the gospel, and that is Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is not about impression, which impression I can give as a speaker, and it's not about form. Can I find a form that manipulates my hearers? It is about content. So, in 1 Corinthians, Paul is opposing not the use of the mind, not apologetics, but the rhetoric of the sophist. He goes against uh, human wisdom and the rhetorical eloquence. And he will... Uh, focus instead of the content of the gospel, and that is Christ and him crucified. So in 117 and in 2.2, you have the expression of, uh, or 2.1, of eloquence, that it's not with eloquence. Then, of course, one can still ask questions about what about the passage in between, where Paul talks about the foolishness of the cross, for example, what, what does he mean? Well, again, I think we need to read this carefully. I hear a lot of uh, Christians in Sweden saying, well, Paul talked about the foolishness of the, of the cross. So the gospel is foolish, but we believe it anyway. As if Paul claimed that the cross was foolish. He does not. Not at all. If you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, he says, the message of the cross is foolishness for those who perish. Not that it is foolishness in itself. It, it is regarded as foolishness by those who perish. They accuse it of being foolish. But in itself, says Paul, the message of the cross is God's wisdom and God's power. So I always become very upset when Christians are saying the message of the cross is foolishness but we believe it anyway. What? You're quoting the world. You're quoting our enemies. You're quoting those who oppose the gospel. We should say what Paul says is the actual truth about the gospel. It's God's wisdom and God's power. That is its true nature. And we need to show the unbelievers your impression is wrong. It's actually not foolishness. It's wisdom and power. And you can see how Paul is elaborating between two different forms of wisdom. 
So he talks about the true wisdom and the false wisdom, or, or to quote him, he talks about God's wisdom. So, of course, what God has done and said is the true wisdom. And Paul never denies that. It's true. It's the ultimate wisdom, what God has said and done. And then fallen human beings put up their own wisdom, what Paul called then human or worldly wisdom. And we need to sort this out, of course. And we need to reject the worldly wisdom, which is not built on Christ. And, and the goal is there always that man can boast in himself. And Paul is so clear, we, there's nothing we can boast about. But the true wisdom is what God has done in Christ. And we should boast in him. That is the deep, ultimate wisdom. The gospel about Jesus Christ. So, uh, as an apologist, I'm, I'm happy I'm not forced to quit my job and start to do something else. Uh, so I don't think that Paul is against apologetics. And I think, uh, as an apologist, uh, that uh, 1 Corinthians, actually, if you take the whole letter, uh, very strongly supports the apologetic calling, uh, that we should argue persuasively for the gospel, like Paul does later on in 1 Corinthians. If you think of chapter 15, when he presents the gospel about Christ, who died for our sins according to Scripture and was buried, who was raised on the third day according to Scripture, and who appeared. And then he, he argues, he gives the list of those Christ appeared for. And he invites people to say, well, those 500, most of them are still alive. Yeah, a few have died during those years, but most of them are still here. You can interview them. You can check my information here. It was a real event. God raised Jesus from the dead. So he's arguing later on in the chapter. Okay, I, I rest my case. 1 Corinthians is not an anti-apologetic text.